Oh, good morning, everybody. Um, yep, my name's Andrew Sullivan. Um, and my, uh, my task here is to talk to you about uh, some work that we did on the Black Saturday fires, and particularly the uh, reconstruction of the Kilmore East fire, um, looking at its behaviour and spread. So a brief overview. Basically, the work that we did was published in a paper in Forest Ecology and Management um, a number of years ago. I'm going to talk about sort of things that we did for the reconstruction, um, brief discussion of the fuels that were involved, some of the observational data that we collected, and then um, go through in some detail the fire progression that we determined and a little bit of a, a summary of the behaviour. Um, in the aftermath of many major events like this, there are a lot of claims made about fires and what they did. One that sticks in my memory is a, was a um, oh, let's call it an observation that the fire spread 60 kilometres in a minute, which is about three times the speed of sound. <laughs> <laughs> so things like that you always need to take with a grain of salt until you can actually collect the data and, and determine exactly what happened, and that was, that was our task here. So, just some background. Um, Graham did a very good job of talking about the weather, so I'm not going to talk about the weather. Um, and I'll just go into some details of, of the day in terms of the fires. So the Kilmore East fire started on farmland east of Kilmore, surprise, surprise, at about 11.45 in the morning. It was one of more than 400 fires that started on the day, uh, and one of 13 of those fires that became major fires. This fire burnt more than 100,000 hectares in less than 12 hours. Uh, 121 people were killed out of the 173 that died on that day. And more than 2,000 uh, buildings were destroyed. So the task for the reconstruction of the, of the spread of behaviour of the fire basically was to collect and collate any and all data that we could get our hands on that might be pertinent. So this includes uh, observed weather at the uh, automatic weather stations, physical evidence of fire behaviour, such as um, the consumption of the fuel, intensity of the fire, leaf freeze, information about the fuel states themselves from fire history records, uh, fuel assessments, um, etc. And a lot of remotely sensed data, including post-fire post aerial photography um, and satellite imagery. But one of the key inputs into any reconstruction is actually eyewitness accounts. Um, and it takes a lot of effort to go and ask the right questions of the right people to get information rather than opinion on um, what fires did. And then our task was to analyse all that um, and to build an understanding of, of what the fire did and develop a chronology and a narrative uh, of, of events. So the black outline here is the final perimeter of the Kilmore East fire. And this is a, a vegetation map that shows that predominantly where the fire started was farmland with scattered trees. Uh, for most of the fire area it was dry sclerophyll forest and there are large, there's a large catchment in there, the Wallaby Creek catchment, that has tall wet forest. Yeah. Um, grass curing on the day, this is the uh, satellite derived grass curing map for the day. Um, with forests sort of masked out, shows that for most of the state everything was, was pretty much fully cured. Um, in the area that we're looking here, up on the escarpment, the grasslands that were there, mostly um, pastures, were between 50 and 80% cured. So not bone dry, but pretty dry. We undertook and Stuart uh, helped me with this, we undertook some modelling of the fuel moisture content uh, on the day, um, applying uh, Stuart's process-based model of um, litter moisture content, taking into account solar radiation, um, atmospheric conditions and fuels and such. And that was also published um, in the paper. That shows the progression of the drying out of the fuels over the day. So it, Midday, not long after the fire started, you can't quite see the, the contrast there, but everything in the lower elevations is around 3 to 4% moisture. 
we consider anything less than 10% really dry. And so even before midday, most of the countryside was, was extremely dry. Up on the, on the higher elevations, the moisture content was around five to six. We stepped forward two hours, two o'clock in the afternoon, and you can see that we're almost as dry as you can ever get fuel for most of the countryside. Up on the, up, up on the higher elevations, we're all down to less than 5%. So basically, the entire countryside was less than 5% moisture content, which means that any spark is going to start a fire. And then in the middle of the afternoon, um, it's only basically the, the Mount Disappointment region that's, that's not less than 4% moisture content. And then as the day wears on into the evening, moisture returns. So the leaf freeze and char work that we did was looking at trying to determine the direction of spread of the fire. So char will form on the lee side of tree of trees and toasts and what have you, so you can tell what direction the fire was travelling when it burnt that post. And any leaves that haven't been consumed when they've been scorched by the fire will actually freeze in the direction that they were pointing when the fire goes past. So you can very quickly determine what the local direction of wind flow was when the fire um, went through. And if you do that enough over the countryside, you can actually build a map, sometimes rather confused, uh, of the prevailing direction of the wind when the fire went through. <coughs> so post-fire aerial photographs are very useful. This was flown by the, um, what, what was, or well, what is dealt now, I can't remember what it used to be called, and it changed the name so many times, at 15 centimetre resolution, which is extremely um, high resolution, which can tell us exactly so this is the point of ignition. You can see all of the uh, tyre tracks of the vehicles that went to have a look after the fire. Um, but you can also see sections of defoliated and scorched um, forest. This is a fire intensity map derived from uh, satellite imagery, where essentially we've mapped um, the vegetation, the, the, the burn severity in the vegetation by how much defoliation of the trees. Where we've got total defoliation, full crown consumption, it's black, and then it goes uh, down the scale as you get less and less full crown consumption. So you can see that there's large patches here and up here where there's nothing left on the trees at all after the fire went through. In these later sections over here, which actually, as Kevin mentioned early on, burnt some weeks later, um, the fire was less intense, but still enough to, to leave a pattern. And also, as Kevin mentioned before, the wind change was very important. So this is basically the same data that, that um, Kevin, uh, Graham showed um, with the passage of the of the wind change over the fire area and as you can see here the, the start of the wind change over the fire area was sometime before six o'clock in the evening um, and that was completed by about seven o'clock in the evening. So the start of the fire caused by a logical fault on private property at about 11.45. They know fairly precisely because it was the, um, the recording of the fault in the electrical system. Um, and it was reported by the, the observer in the fire tower at Mount Hickey two minutes later, which is rather remarkable. And he took some photos. So this is 16 minutes after the fire started, an hour and a bit after the fire started, and two, almost three hours after the fire started. So you can see that there's a very strong wind and a, a very um, wind blown fire um, in those early stages. So this is the summary of the progression of the fire. 11.45, we've got our ignition point up here. For the first 15 minutes or so, the fire was spreading rapidly through grazed farmland, uh, farm paddocks um, and scattered woods, undulating topography, and the rate of spread was about two kilometres an hour. Over the next hour, you can see the fire up here now, 
Um, basically, same vegetation type, uh, heavily grazed paddocks, um, open scattered woodland. There was an edge of a pine plantation that it uh, started to burn into, um, and many of the trees that were involved were, were torching individually. There was some short distance spotting, and the rate of spread was about 4.3 kilometres an hour. In the next hour period, this green line is the Hume Highway, which is two double lanes with a median strip in the middle. Fire spotted over that at about uh, just after half past one, and then continued to spread through heavily grazed paddocks with a slight change in the wind direction. And the first initial phase was northerly, and then it shifted to north or west. Um, within this area, there's some denser pad paddocks uh, of dry woodland um, and a number of large blue gum radiata plantations. Rate of spread hadn't changed very much from the previous period. Into the next hour, it started to get into more complex topography of the Hume Range, which uh, involves steeper topography and um, much denser dry eucalypt forest. There was also uh, increased spotting in a uh, long arm burnt forest. Some of this area hadn't been burnt since fires in 1926. Most of the area had burnt um, on Black Friday in 1939. So speed is still around four and a bit kilometres an hour. Um, spotting is now becoming the dominant propagation mechanism. So it's not a propagating front, it's spots that are starting to uh, drive the, the spread of this fire. From 3 o'clock in the afternoon to 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the fire started to increase in intensity uh, as it approached Mount Disappointment. It ran into heavier uh, mixed dry wet forest. There was a lot of short range spotting that was driving um, the spread of this fire particularly, but it was in this period that some long distance spots were starting to, um, to occur. Um, observations of, of spots up to 40 kilometres from about quarter past three. And the speed of the fire has now increased quite significantly to about nine and a bit kilometres an hour. This next period from four o'clock to five o'clock, uh, this has all been coloured in, but over this period, there's no front as such. And you may recall that there were lots of claims of, of people saying fire is everywhere, we don't know which way to go. That is literally true. They were surrounded by so many spot fires, there wasn't a front of fire to which you could actually face and respond to. Um, if this period here is, is when many of the fatalities occurred, and you'll notice names like Strathuon, um, and St Andrews and all sorts of other um, names that have gone down in infinity now uh, where, where fatalities occurred. This active zone of fire is about 7,500 hectares. Um, many of the spot fires that had landed here off the top of Mount's appointment were now spotting themselves. So that we've now got um, second and third order fires, if you, if you will, as the fire main fire is spotted, those fires are spotting and the spot fires are spotting again. And in this zone here is what MacArthur called way back in the 60s, pseudo fire fronts. So there's no frontal fire as such. Over this next period is when the wind change started to come through. Um, many of the fires in the light heavily grazed fields could be controlled um, uh, because the fields becoming, uh, were discontinuous. But the primary fire was extremely intense and it was erratic um, and it was burning back. <coughs> burning back into those areas between spots that hadn't, uh, hadn't been consumed previously. Between 17, uh, sorry, 6 o'clock and 7 o'clock is the, is the arrival of the front and you can see the, the typical pattern of, of major fire in, in southwestern or southeastern Australia, burning with the northwesterly, cold front comes through and suddenly you've got the whole flank that turns into a head fire. So the increase um, in fire areas quite substantial, it's almost three times now. Um, it, go back a step. For most of the afternoon, the fire was actually held up against the escarpment. 
in the human range of scarp. So it was channeled by the north-northwesterly wind and the topography to its left as it was spreading with the wind. After the change, the fire went up the escarpment and across the top of the plateau. Up here, there were a number of um, paddock areas that were less cured, and so the fire behaviour was less intense. But you also had large areas of um, forested area that were, were um, ready to burn. So broad active front across 35, 40 kilometres of, of area there. Um, so for the next four hours or so, the fire continued to spread um, on multiple fronts through dry skyfall forest. And at, at about midnight, um, most of the spread had stopped. There was rain that occurred in patches. Um, in, yeah, localised rain showers occurred and basically the, the spread of the fire all along this <laughs> flank did not progress at all after that. Fire continued to burn down here around Tulangi and um, Healesville for a couple of weeks. But just in summary, if we look at burn times, um, the period between 3 o'clock and 4 o'clock in the afternoon is when the fire was at its highest intensity, spreading at about 9 kilometres an hour, which is pretty much close to some of the highest rates of spread that have been recorded for forest fires in Australia. Um, the intensity of this fire was, was about 88 megawatts per metre, which is extremely high. A couple of periods, we just cannot determine what the rate of spread was because there was no front of fire to measure the speed of, and as a result there's no intensity measurements, but you could imagine that it was, was quite horrendous. And this chart just shows um, where most of the crown consumption or, or fuel consumption is occurring through the life of the fire. And you can see that after the change of fire, there's, there's that rapid increase in fire area was, was where most of the, um, the damage was done. So just as a little bit of a summary, here's some, some context for other fire events, uh, plotting the fire line intensity against the forest fire danger index. Um, We've got where we do experimental fires down the bottom left. Uh, line here, which is the maximum intensity for direct suppression of, of wildfires. And then you've got a number of wildfires, um, Hobart. Um, these two are Ash Wednesday in Victoria, the Camaginelli fires in Sydney in 94, uh, and the South Australian Ash Wednesday fire up here. Um, and that's where the Kilmore East fire sits in that scheme of things. So it's, it's, it's not an unprecedented uh, fire, but it is one of the worst and certainly was one of the worst impacts. Thank you.